good evening. We are so glad to have you with us this month. We have an outstanding show prepared for you. Uh, as always, I tell you, get pencil, paper, take notes, because we have so much information. I don't want you to miss anything. My first guest in talking about everything electric, of course, is the CEO of Valley Electric, and that's Mark Stallings. And Mark, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Nice I, to see you. I am glad to have you here this evening. Now, one of the things that I know everybody is interested in is what is Valley Electric? What is it all about? Uh, you have a lot of questions because I've been receiving a lot of questions. But the first thing I want to do is introduce you to Mark. And Mark, how long have you been here? And tell us some of your background. I began at uh, Valley Electric on January 6, 2020. Uh, prior to that, I had been in uh, northern Kentucky at Electric Co-op uh, that served uh, suburbs of Cincinnati and a lot of rural areas just south of Cincinnati, about 62,000 meters and, and uh, a larger, large co-op. Uh, we didn't uh, have our own power supply or transmission at Owen Electric, and uh, when I came to Valley, obviously we have uh, transmission uh, we have our substations, and then we have the dis distribution system as well. Uh, prior to being in northern Kentucky, I was in southern Illinois at oh. another co-op, and I managed that co-op from 2002 through 2009. I was in northern Kentucky from 2009 through 2019. And uh, it co-ops from 91 to uh, 2002 in uh, Illinois and Michigan. My wife's from Michigan, so I, I landed up there for about uh, eight years at an electric co-op. And then prior to that, I was with Standard Oil of Ohio. I okay. did a lot of project and design work and uh, con construction work with Standard Oil all over the eastern U.S. So a very good background to bring to Valley Electric. And so you've been the CEO for the time that you've mentioned. And I know quite a few people have sent me quite a few questions. And I know you're going to be covering that this evening. And they're, he's going to answer all of your questions. All the questions that you sent in to me, he, he's already, already prepared to answer. But you mentioned co-op a couple times. Now, what's the difference between a co-op and a non-co-op entity? I didn't mention it, but I had two years at, at what I call an investor-owned utility. Uh, two years I worked up in Michigan for a consumer's power company. An investor-owned utility, uh, Nevada Energy, Duke, uh, American Electric Power, uh, they are owned by the investors. Uh, and the investors elect a board of directors and the board of directors elects a management team. Uh, in the co-op, the owners are the members, are the customers. Okay. And so we typically call our owners customers. Okay. And uh, we divide the co-op up into districts. And uh, we have uh, seven districts at uh, Valley Electric. And uh, each of those districts elect a director. And that director represents the members and their interests on the board of directors. The board of directors hires me, uh, and I then in turn manage the day-to-day. -day, and the board of directors uh, uh, develop policy. They develop the budget and approve the budget. Uh, and the, the major uh, goals and the strategy and the direction of the co-op come from the board of directors. Uh, the day-to-day -day operations and the day-to-day and -day detail is uh, managed by the uh, general manager or the CEO. There okay. are 900 co-ops nationwide, and we range from 2,000 meters all the way up to 300,000 meters. Uh, Valley Electric is what I would say a mid-size co-op at 25,000 meters. But what makes Valley Electric different is that we are not a member of a generation transmission co-op, meaning we buy our own power supply. The other thing that makes us different is we own uh, transmission and substations. Now Valley sold their 230 kV transmission to Grid Lions back in 2017, but we own the 138, we own all the substations. And even though we sold the 230, mm -hmm. it was mostly a balance sheet transaction. We operate, maintain, and system control that 230 kV. So we still, on a day-to-day -day basis, we operate like we always used to. Okay. But the balance sheet doesn't have the ownership of that line on it. Oh. 
So. And I, I know some people are very interested in that part as well. But I want to say I know we have some people that are watching that are under Valley Electric, and most of the people that are watching probably are under Valley Electric, but there are some that are under NV Energy. And what is the difference, or what are the, some of the comparisons? Um, NV Energy is millions of meters in the big city with a large density. Uh, Valley Electric, uh, in Pahrump, we have good density, similar. It's not really, well, somewhat similar to, to uh, Las Vegas, but not quite. I mean, when you look at Las Vegas, houses are 10, 15 feet apart. Right. When you look at Pahrump, houses are 100 feet, 200 feet apart, or maybe a half mile apart. But if you get up in Fish Lake, or in Beatty, or Amargosa, or Sandy Valley, houses could be a half mile, two miles. In Fish Lake, it's three miles apart, four miles, five miles apart. So we have some very, very rural areas, and then uh, Pahrump is obviously a very dense uh, po population, but nowhere near similar to, uh, to uh, uh, Nevada Power or, or Nevada Energy. Uh, the other thing that makes this difference is really the governance structure. Okay. My board of directors set the policy, set the direction, approve the budget, approve the debt, uh, approve the strategy. And they, that strategy gives me the direction on where to go. Uh, and they're elected by the members. And as Valley Electric members know, um, the board changes. Um, I, I've got, I think, three new directors since I've been here in three years. I have a total of seven directors. Uh, and they are my bosses, and they represent the member's interest. Uh, the other difference is if a member calls with a question I, uh, and they want to meet with me, I, I meet with them and talk to them. Uh, and so open door policy, I like that. Yeah, open door policy. Uh, it's uh, not all of our information is available. I mean, we're not going to turn over every, every paycheck we write or every, every bill we pay but our audits are posted on our website, our financials are posted on the website, our agenda to the board meeting is posted on the website. Uh, so there's a lot more open, available data. Uh, our strategies on the website. Uh, we and just finished and what the is, audit. What is the website? The website is, uh, I usually just Google uh, VE, Valley Electric, typically okay. is what I do, and I make sure I'm on I think it's vea.coop, C-O-O-P. Okay. Uh, but our website really has all of the information that the members would want to know about. Uh, we've got a section on the PCA. We will post this interview on mm -hmm. our website. Okay. Uh, I've done other interviews, and we post those on the website as Very well. Very good. Okay. And so anything that's going to be a major change, it's always on the website. Uh, we're changing our billing right now. That's all on the website. And, we and talk billing about is it. something I know everybody is interested in. I'm, I'm sure they are. Be, yeah. but before we get into that, I, I, something you said earlier about the, the directors, and you have so many districts and you have so many directors. And if people have questions, if people are concerned about things, they should be talking to their directors. And I'm going to ask how many people out there know who their director is. And if they don't know, they can go to the website and find out, correct? Correct. Uh, Rural Light, our monthly magazine. Absolutely. That's another great source it to is. find out what's going on. Uh, we had a whole article on uh, the power cost adjuster. We had a whole article on the rate change in January. We had a whole article on, on the billing changes. We're going through a lot of change. Mm -hmm. And we are upgrading all of our software we're upgrading all of our processes and work processes, mainly because we have to get more efficient and more productive at what we do on a daily basis. And we're paying attention to the day-to-day -day details that uh, in the past weren't quite paid attention to as much as I like to pay attention to them. You know, you mentioned something else too. Uh, the things that you're putting out in the magazine, the Rural Light, the things that are on your website, the questions that I've received because I've asked a lot of people, look, I'm going to have the CEO on my show, and what would you like me to ask him? And the questions that, that they are asking are all covered in the magazine or on the website. So why aren't they looking at the magazine and the website? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, 
For those of us that have been in the co-op business for years, we ask that question. But in reality, people live their lives and their lives are busy. Okay. And they don't always look. I don't, you know, I don't know why, but that I, you know, I almost, I have to accept that reality. We try to reach out to a lot of different marketing channels, and I know you'll understand marketing channels. I, we put a full page ad in the Prump Valley Times. Yes. Now we put a full page ad because you can't change an ad. When I give a full page ad, that's the message. Now that full page ad, ad is on our website. Yes. It's also in the Rural Light, the monthly magazine. Yes, it is. Um, and so the other thing we do, and I think it's different from an investor-owned utility, and you had asked that question, so I'm going to kind of circle back to that. The other thing we do is we will, uh, we have district meetings. And at those district meetings, the slide decks that are on the website, the okay. data that was in the Prump Valley Times, the data that we put on our Facebook page, that was all covered in a slide deck in our district meetings. Okay. Now we'll have 20 to 30 people attend a district meeting. We don't have hundreds. Uh, so, but we reach that audience. And typically at the end, and it's, it was about a two hour, two hour dis Q and A discussion uh, with a slide deck. At the end of that Q and A, people understood and they got it. And like me, they don't like their bill going up, right? Uh, but they understood why. Okay. And so our, my goal is really to help people understand why. And that's what we're going to be talking about for our next session, because we talk about PCA, and PCA stands for the Price Cost Adjustment? Power Cost Adjustment. Power Cost Adjustment. And we'll get to that in our next session. Welcome back. I'm here with Mark Stallings. He's the uh, CEO of Valley Electric. And we've been talking about a lot of things that, that cover all the people who are serviced by Valley Electric. Now, we know we have people that are also watching that are served by Nevada Energy, and they're looking at that, but you might want to come out and join Nye County and find out exactly what's going on here because are we better, are we worse? Uh, Mark is here to tell us all about that, and I think it's, a, it's an eye-opener for all of us. So, Mark, tell us more about exactly what's going on. Yeah, what, I've been asked that question many, many times in the last six months. And basically what's going on is the energy markets, the energy environment nationwide, as well as worldwide, is changing. Okay. And if I can put it in the context of we're moving from a carbon economy to a green economy, uh, that change has been going on for the last 20 years uh, at a relatively moderate, slow pace. In the last three, four years, it's accelerated. Okay. Mainly because of the regulatory and environmental decisions that have been made by the executive branch over the last 10, 12 years. And it's all coming to fruition. It's mm -hmm. all coming to play. And what's happening is the supply of electricity is changing uh, to a more renewable base. And the renewable base power supply is, is available from 9 o'clock to 5 o'clock and there's excess solar and excess renewable because the sun shines uh, the most once the sun's fully up in the sky at nine o'clock and, uh, and once it starts dropping at four o'clock, uh, we see solar production dramatically falling off. Okay. So the typical production hours of solar energy renewable is uh, nine o'clock to five o'clock. Okay. And there's an excess of production in those hours and it's driven the price extremely low in those hours. And it's replaced coal-fired plants, some natural gas. Uh, so what's happened is when you get outside of those solar hours that energy's produced, okay. there's not as much generating capacity available. So there's less capacity from 5 o'clock to 10 o'clock. There's less capacity from 5 in the morning to 9 in the morning. There's more supply than we need in the middle of the day. So the price point of power supply has become extremely volatile. In the early morning hours and in the late, in the evening hours from five to 10, the price can easily be above $100 a megawatt hour. Wow, okay. It could, and that's 10 cents a kilowatt hour. 
in the month of December 2022, the price hit uh, on average 25 cents a kilowatt hour every hour of the month of December. Uh, our energy price at that time was roughly 12 cents. Nevada Energy's energy rate was somewhere in the similar range, okay. a little bit less than us at that time. Uh, but we were both losing, and I can't really, I shouldn't speak for Nevada Energy, but I suspect they were seeing the same thing we are. Okay. But uh, during the month of December, we were losing money every hour of the day. Wow. And I, had, I have never seen that happen. Uh, in the summer months, uh, the price will spike. When it's 115 degrees in southern Nevada, their uh, supply of energy is tight, extremely tight, uh, and, uh, and the price goes sky high. Okay. And so we have seen that. That began in, on August 14th, 2020. And prior to that, uh, prices were stable, pretty low, pretty reasonable. Uh, Valley had no rate pressure. Uh, every year since then, our power supply prices have gone up double digits. And uh, we've been holding back rates as long as we can. And we've been cutting costs as much as we can. In fact, we've reduced our costs from 2017 by eight and a half million dollars. Uh, four and a half million on the day-to-day -day operating costs and four million on the depreciation and interest. But we've cut everything we can cut. There's nothing left to cut. So you're doing that to help your, your customers, uh, which, are, which is also, because it's a co-op, you're talking about the owners. Yes. So, yeah. so you're doing everything you can to help us. But what about those people like me who are on a fixed income? and maybe we're having difficulty. I know you have programs within Valley Electric like to help those people. What are those? Yeah, the, the biggest program uh, we work with, we just partnered with NODA, Nevada Outreach. Okay. And that was a wonderful partnership. And the reason we did that is because NODA deals with more than just electrical bills. They deal with uh, everything that affects a household in terms of finances, okay. in terms of struggles and they have resources outside of what Valley can, can do. Uh, they were just awarded a large grant. And so we partnered with NODA and they manage our assistance program. In 2022, Valley Electric through NODA, we provided over $770,000 of assistance Excellent. to our members. Uh, it's not enough, you know, uh, but it's $770,000. But that partnership with NOTAS has been a really nice partnership. The other thing we're doing, and we've been promoting this, and I, and I wish we had more people sign up for it. In the last month, 50 people have signed up for it. Okay. Uh, prior to that, we had 200 people. Now it's roughly 250. And what I'm talking about is the ACP. Uh, it's for broadband. And if I try, I'm struggling to remember what ACP stands for. So I'm going to look, do a little cheat sheet here. Okay, go right and ahead. Look at my slide, Affordable Connectivity Program. Okay. So what that is, is that's a government grant program that you can go online and sign up for. And it's income-based, so you have to fill out, and there's all this different criteria. Uh, and so you may meet the economic criteria. And as a senior, uh, you don't have kids, so you're not going to, qualify because you have a kid in school okay. unless you've got a grandson or a granddaughter with you who's in school and then you then you may qualify uh, but most people are going to qualify through the income basis okay and so um, members can get on the website and we've been putting this in our a monthly magazine the rural light it's on our website and we help people walk through that but that's a thirty dollar credit every month you can't beat that. Yeah, and so you sign up for it, you get approved. Uh, we're telling our employees about it because a lot of our employees have kids in the school system. Okay. And so why not take advantage of it? So in times where your power bill's going up, in times, uh, you know, this is a good time to, hey, do you qualify for the ACP? And if you do, take advantage of it. Okay. So... With that, in doing all the things you can to help and assist the customers, um, I, I, I like that. I like the idea that you're, you're doing that and you're working with 
uh, Nevada Outreach that helps so many people in our community. So um, what about budget billing? And uh, you just talked about the assistance program. But yeah, the budget billing, it's another, it's another program that's, that's really underutilized. Uh, but what that would do is, uh, for example, if your highest bill's 400 and your lowest bill's 100, maybe your average bill would come out to be 200 or 210. And so you would be paying $210 every month instead of seeing a $100 bill in April and a $400 bill gotcha. in, in August. So it's pretty stabilized. It would way. stabilize the bill. Okay. The other thing I like about it is that it's a rolling 12 average. So the other thing it does is it dampens any rate change because what it's going to do is it's going to look back over the last 12 months and calculate the average of those 12 months. Next month, it's going to look over the average of the past 12 months and average that, and that'll be your bill. Okay. So it's a rolling 12-month average. And so what you've done is instead of having a rate increase in one month hit you, it's going to be rolled in over a 12-month average. I like that. And that's a pretty clever, clever yeah. move. I haven't done that on my billing. I'm sitting here going, hmm, Mark, you really ought to apply for the budget billing. And I was because thinking it makes exactly a lot of sense. the same thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and most people don't know about it. And it's kind of one of the amazing things is even that we've got these programs, we put them in rural light, we have them on our webpage, but you know, people have busy lives. We just, we're busy and you know, so the more I can get the word out, hopefully the more people will sign up for That's it. That's what we want to do. Now, another thing, that people have, have come to me and asked about is years ago, and I, I arrived here in 08, and we were receiving credit at the end of each year. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that credit. Where has it gone? What is it doing? Is it still there? Yeah, well, I think what you're talking about is a capital credit. Every year we take what our margins, which would be the difference between our revenue and our expenses, okay. and we allocate those margins to every member based upon their energy or kilowatt hour usage. Okay. So a big user will get allocated more than a small user. Right. Uh, but those are allocated. The board then, at the end of the year, usually in November, October, November, makes a decision. They look at the financials, and they make a decision about paying out capital credits. So in your account, you, you have X dollars that, uh, that have been credited to your account over the last and if you've been here 30 years, it'd be over the last 30 years. If you've been here 10, it'd be over the last 10 years. Okay. And so you have banked X amount of capital credits. So the board then looks at what our cash position is, what our financial position is, and they determine, can we reasonably pay out capital credits? In 2022, uh, the board decided to pay out capital credits for the prior year, and it was at the tune of a million dollars of okay. capital credits. It's actually 21. We paid it in 22. Okay. We paid them in March of 22, somewhere February, March. But it was based upon 2021. And uh, so we paid out a million dollars. Uh, most people don't recognize it or see it, okay? Uh, you take a million dollars and you spread it over 25,000 meters and yes. you know, I don't know what that average is. We'll say it's forty dollars, but some people will get fifteen based on their usage. Some will get forty. Some may get a hundred. The ones who get a hundred probably remember it. <laughs> the ones that get fifteen or twenty, it may get buried in the bill and they don't even recognize it. Yes. And if you never look at your bill, you're not. And it's on your bill as a credit. You'll never know. So, well, so we're going to encourage you to look at your bill. We're going to encourage you to. Any questions you have about Valley Electric, we want you to contact them. You've looked at their website. Don't forget to read the magazine. And call if you have any questions because they're there. You can always call. You can always go to the website. Mark is here. And Mark, I want to thank you again for coming and talking to our audience about Valley Electric. And I'd be happy to come back anytime and talk about more, more issues because I know we didn't cover all the questions. So I'd thank be you. happy to do that. Thank you. Welcome back. We're so glad to have you back with us. I have a new guest, and this new guest has so much information for you. I know you're going to be very interested in everything that Heather Freeman has to say. 
Heather, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on. I am so glad to have you. Heather is a Master Gardener Coordinator, and she's going to tell you what that's all about and tell you how you can be, I guess, part of this program if you're interested at all, and I can guarantee you're going to be interested after watching and listening to what Heather has to say. So, Heather, I, I want to ask the question, how long have you been involved as a Master Gardener? Okay, um, I was able to take the Master Gardener Coordinator, or Master Gardener Volunteer Training Course in 2008 here locally. Um, got involved with the program and I've been volunteering with them ever since. Oh, me, great. Um, in 2019, I had the opportunity to um, take on the Master Gardener Coordinator position just to help keep the program going and I've been there ever since. Okay, now this program is under what? Um, so we are part of the University of Nevada, Reno um, Extension Program. Um, and uh, we've got some slides. Well, before we go to the slides, uh, who is the program for? Uh, adults, children, uh, how would you say that? And what age group do you normally have your students and what class size do you have? Okay, so our ages are, it's for adults. Okay. Um, the training course tends to be um, at a college level, but aimed at the average person. So don't be intimidated by the coursework. <laughs> okay. Um, it's a two-part course that runs uh, 10 weeks for part one, um, and they call that the home horticulture. And part two is advanced home horticulture that is also the master gardener training part. So that's also another 10 weeks. And this year it's um, the registration opened now um, and it will run August 3rd through September 29th. And we'll take about a month off and start up again the last week of October through the last week of December to do the second part. Okay. Now I know you're going to go through some slides on a and the slides have a lot of information on it. So we want you to be ready to write down this information and we'll gladly repeat it for you. Heather's gonna be very good at letting you know exactly what you need to do, what you need to know to talk about the Master Gardener program. Go ahead, Heather. Okay, so um, the history of the Master Gardener program is that it was started in 1972 in Washington State. Um, it was started by the extension staff there because they were being inundated with consumer questions asking about what to do about plants. And over the last 50 years, it has grown to all 50 states. Um, nationwide, there's 86,000 Master Gardener volunteers. And um, on average, Master Gardeners donate about 60 hours a year which works out to about an hour, a little bit more than that a month, a, a week, sorry. <laughs> four, <laughs> about four hours a, a month. That's quite impressive, yep. go ahead. Um, and we help over 8.6 million people through different helplines, workshops, plant clinics, and more. Um, so in Nevada, the very first Master Gardener training course up in Reno was in 1974. Um, down in Clark County, it was in 1992, and some master gardeners from Pahrump participated in the 1994 program. So um, we've had a demonstration garden here in Pahrump since 1997, and uh, that brought us to 2002, was the 50th anniversary of the master gardener program nationwide. Okay, and 22, yeah. yeah. Um, so what do we do? Uh, the purpose of the program is to help people, plants, and partnerships in the community. Um, it's a group of motivated individuals that use gardening to make a difference. So this photo shows a couple of master gardeners at the helpline in, in Vegas. And we also have a help desk. It's mobile. <laughs> um, it rings into my cell phone. So. Uh, I'm pretty much, if I am not available to answer it at the moment, it goes to voicemail. So if you have a gardening question, you definitely can get in touch. 
And that's here in Pahrump? That's here in Pahrump. Yeah. Okay. So, and if, I, if we don't know the answer, we definitely will forward it to one of the um, horticulture specialists and find out. Believe me, Heather has all the answers. <laughs> I know where to find most of the answers. Okay. Um, so to become an Extension Master Gardener volunteer, it's a, a three-step process. Um, first of all, you can complete the, the two-level training that runs from August through December of this year. Okay. Um, and you, there's a little interview process um, to go through, too. It's um, just to make sure that people are a good fit. Um, but to we, make sure you're interested in this program. Right, yeah. And okay. even if you're not interested in volunteering with us, you can still take the course, both okay. parts. Um, then there's an internship where you are um, partnered with a mentor, master gardener, um, and learn kind of the ropes. And one of our easiest answers to a question is, that's a really great question. I will find out the answer and get back to you. Because we'd rather, you know, rather than give an answer that we might not know about, we want to make sure that we um, give you good information. That's excellent. And okay. then um, the third step is just to maintain your yearly status as a Master Gardener volunteer, which is really easy to do. Um, about one hour a week or four hours a month, and um, that's all it takes. So one morning working out in the garden can take care of that. Okay. <laughs> um, there's a little more details uh, about what is the course involved. So... They're, they've taken it to an online format, which makes it easier for people that might still be working a day job or maybe they do their best studying early in the morning or later at night. That way you're not tied into studying at the same time as other people. Set your own hours. You can set your own hours for yeah, reading okay. the chapters and there are pre-recorded lectures, quizzes. Um, there's some discussion boards. So if you have a question while you're reading, you can type it in right then and there. Um, and then once a week, there's a live question and answer session with the um, specialist or horticulture expert that was the topic of the week. Okay. And that's a one hour a week on Zoom. Um, and then same thing for the second part. There's nine chapters, uh, a 10 week course, um, reading, lectures, quizzes, and again, the Q&A. And that part involves some um, hands-on labs with the county coordinators, which would be me. <laughs> um, and then to uh, keep up your, or to get your internship, you do 35 project hours, um, 15 continuing ed hours, which is um, more gardening topics that you might be interested in. Um, and then we do maintain our volunteer hours in a centralized reporting system, and that just uh, helps us keep track of everyone's hard work. That way you can um, be rewarded appropriately. Now, you said earlier this is like college level. Do you get a, how do you get credit for it? Is there a certificate, diploma, or what? Um, it is a certificate that you would get, okay. but it doesn't matriculate for course credit anywhere. So there are people that want to get a horticulture degree. Yes. Um, it doesn't go towards credit for that. So. But it does give you the experience. It does give you the experience. Okay. It does give you a really good background. Um, and uh, it's, it's an honor to be a Master Gardener volunteer. I think it would be. Just yeah. the title. Yes. Yeah. So... Um, so the active master gardener status, um, we do a lot of projects around the um, local office. This is a picture of one of the um, storyboards that the 4-H kids did in, the, in our garden here locally in Pahrump. Um, the writing club wrote a story and placed it around the garden. So um, that's just kind of a fun thing. And then, um, let's see. So what are some volunteer opportunities? Um, helping with research, uh, curriculum development, um, hosting a booth at an Ask a Master Gardener table, um, 
if you have a passion for a particular topic, we have a program called Gardening Under the Stars with Master Gardeners where you could write up your own PowerPoint or presentation and teach someone else. Mine was on pomegranates this year. <laughs> um, oh. And one thing that our master gardeners do go through a uh, fingerprint and background check so that okay. we're cleared to work with um, youth because that we do a lot of um, crossover events where kids might be involved. And so we just want to make sure that everybody's good to go there. Those are in the, in the volunteer opportunities. Volunteer opportunities, okay. yep. Um, so in Nevada, last year there were 297 certified master gardeners. Um, they donated 27,000 hours, which was worth over $800,000 worth of volunteer time. Um, and there were over 100 volunteer projects around our state of Nevada, too. So. Um, each one of the counties is developing a Master Gardener program. Um, not all of them have one at the time, but we're getting there. Okay. So currently, Washoe County, Douglas County, Carson City, Elko, Southern Nye, Clark, and White Pine all have Master Gardener positions, um, volunteer programs. And Churchill, Pershing, Humboldt, Lander, and Northern Nye and Lyon County all are interested and have had at least one or two um, students take the course. So. so these are the ones that are that have the program out of the 17 counties? Yep. Okay. So, um, and if you want to get in touch with Caitlin, um, there is her uh, email address, extensionmastergardener at unr.edu. Um, on the website, it's extension.unr.edu slash master-gardeners. And there's also a Facebook page, uh, UNR Extension Master Gardeners. This is great. This is great information for all of those that might be interested in becoming a master gardener. And we want you to come back in the next session because Heather has a lot more information for you. So come back and join us. Welcome back. We're glad to have you back with us for our final session. And I have Heather Freeman with me. She's the Master Gardener Coordinator, and she's going to talk about the local things. She's given us the overall view statewide, and now we're getting down to local items. So Heather, tell us something about the local program. Okay, so um, our Southern Nye County Extension is at 1651 East Calvada. That's at the corner of Calvada and Dandelion. And if you've never walked through the demonstration gardens, it, they're beautiful this time of year. I encourage you to come and just enjoy all the blossoms. It, everything's blooming right now. It looks great. Get out there and join us. Um, so every Wednesday, the master gardeners are out working. Um, that's our Wednesday work party day. And we do have a lot of fun. Um, this first photo shows a group of us that are, they were in the process of building a raised bed out of patio pavers. Um, we've been working hard to create different types of um, raised beds using different materials. Uh, patio pavers, they just got build, building one um, out of pallets and cinder blocks. Um, so just the different things people can use to make a raised bed. Um, other things we do is we typically start seedlings in the winter and raise those to um, use in the garden as well as um, offer extra for donations at okay. the, mar the farmer's market. Yeah. Um, one of our projects last year was rebuilding the labyrinth that was washed out in the great weather event of July 2021. <laughs> a flash flood came through the back of the garden and washed it out, but working, coordinating with the Las Vegas Labyrinth Society, they came out and helped us um, move all the stones out of the way. Uh, one of our master gardeners uh, used his tractor and a bunch of chat to repave the area, and uh, it looks really great. So. Last Saturday was the Worldwide Labyrinth Day, May 6th, but it's open during daylight hours just to walk and reflect and 
we're happy a lot of people come out and use it. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Um, let's see. So one of our major projects is uh, hosting the Ask a Master Gardener booth at the Farmer's Market at Tractor Supply. Um, besides answering gardening questions, all the vegetables that are raised in our demonstration vegetable garden we offer for donation at our little booth. And, oh, that's even um, better. This year we have three, and I'm working on a fourth, uh, produce vendor. And then we have a bunch of other cottage food vendors and a lot of um, homemade, home handcrafted um, craft vendors. Uh, we average about 30 craft booth, or 30 booths a week and about 500 people walk through every Saturday. So um, we just switched to summer hours, 7.30 to 11. So um, if you have a question, you can stop in our booth and ask. And get some good vegetables too? Get some good vegetables too. Yep. Locally okay. grown. Everything that's sold at our market is locally raised, locally, locally grown. grown. Yep. I love it. So, um, one of the other projects that we uh, run for the, the town of Pahrump on Nye County is at the Pahrump Fall Fair and Festival, there's a food and horticulture room. Um, the Shadow Mountain Quilters run the fair building and we help with the food and hort room. So we volunteered 155 hours over seven days last year. Uh, we had 129 entries. Um, a, 1,196 people walked through our little fair room in the back. Uh, we gave out 176 free publications and we had 45 residents that were interested in taking the class for this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're coordinating with our Let in the Town office to uh, set it up for this September. So it'll be really, oh, this really is great. well advertising okay. good. Yep. We have a lot of fun. Gotta get the word out. Yep. So. The next few slides show what fun we had at the fair last year. Just uh, intake and deciding whose ribbons were given out. Uh, the, the theme last year was Fabulous 50s, and I hope I won't be letting the cat out of the bag, but this year's theme is Cowboys versus Aliens. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a lot of fun. Oh, gee. I think okay. one of the best things was the big smile on the kids that entered there because we have a, a kids um, category. So that was just a lot of fun seeing people come in and get their ribbons. A lot of ribbons. Okay. And as long as they weren't a judge, even Master Gardeners could put some things into the, um, into the fair as long as they weren't judging their own entry. So okay. a couple of our Master Gardeners won ribbons too. Um, so another thing that we do at our local extension office is we host classes and workshops. Okay. And so some of the past things that we have done um, in October, we did a um, demonstration day in the garden. And we set up six learning stations, um, rose bushes, uh, dividing irises, um, composting, we have a good compost bin going. Um, the vegetable garden, we did a tour. Okay. How to prune palms. And then one of the other, what the other station was, uh, the Labyrinth Society was at the Labyrinth just to talk about you that know, project. You know, I said earlier, that, you know, I'm not a, a gardener, but uh, this sounds very interesting. It, I, think, I think everybody should probably come out and at least find out where, you, where your interest level is. This is true, yep. Um, another thing that we've done for several years, off the top of my head, I don't remember, but I'm gonna say at least 10 years, was a celebration of lights in the garden at Christmas time. Okay. Um, holiday lights, we decorate the garden. Um, it previously has been called Cookies Coco with Santa. <laughs> um, when okay. pandemic shutdown hit, uh, we were closed down for that year. And the last couple of years, we haven't been able to find a Santa. So okay. this year we switched it up and called it Cookies, Cocoa, and Cider in the Garden. <laughs> and we had our state specialists come out and talk about all the different holiday trees that are up for offer mm -hmm. and whether or not you can plant them outside or if it should just stay a house plant or if you should, you know, give it to somebody that lives in Colorado. Okay. Because <laughs> blue spruce really, really won't grow here. 
Okay. But if you can get an Italian stone pine in a pot, that you can plant outside. Wow. So okay. uh, a lot of education going on. And we discovered that cider was more popular than serving hot cocoa. So wow. next year we're going to double our amount of cider. Okay. So um, that's always fun. Uh, we, we have a good time decorating the garden for the public. And this year we put everything on timers and switched it up to LEDs to use low power. And we left, it, left the lights on through New Year's. So oh, beautiful. A lot of people okay. come and walk just to enjoy with their family, even if they can't make it on that night. So another thing we've done for many years is live cut tree recycling. Um, so between Christmas and about the middle of January, uh, we have a collection point for people to drop off their live cut trees okay. if they bought one. And um, then uh, Leighton Tree Service has been the partner for several years um, coming to chip them for us, and then we used all of those chips in the garden as mulch. And okay. uh, that really helps cut down on the water use. If you put down three inches of mulch, it can prevent as much as 80% of transit operation out of the garden, so. Live and learn. Yeah. So That's something I'd never heard before. Mulch okay. really helps once you've, you know, it, it keeps the water in around the root, root ball of what you've planted, so. So the other thing that you mentioned is for all those people that do have Christmas trees mm -hmm. and you want to get rid of them, you don't just dump them out. Right. So contact you guys and you guys will take them mm -hmm. and turn them into mulch. Yep, that's true. Excellent. Okay. Um, so if you haven't ever been by our garden, this is a picture of our uh, Joseph's Coat rose bush. Stop it's and smell the roses. Stop and smell the roses. They okay. just smell oh, gorgeous good. this time of year. And where is this located again? It's at 1651 East Calvada. Okay. Um, corner of Calvada and Dandelion. Right at the corner of Calvada and Dandelion. Yep. And Can't miss it. We yep. also have penstemon, lots and lots of penstemon on both sides of the path, uh, four different colors. And uh, this week and probably next week, our pomegranate trees are also just in full bloom. Okay. And even ones that people think are ornamental pomegranates, if they fruit, we can eat them. <laughs> <laughs> and almost every pomegranate fruits. So. Okay. Um, currently, right now through the month of May, every Tuesday and Thursday evening, we've got a series of free classes going on. And if you want to watch them on Zoom from your home, you can, um, but we also are showing them on the big screen in our prompt office. Okay. Um, they run from six to eight. So currently, even though I'm on TV with Dr. Waters, I'm probably also at, at the Calvada office watching uh, Grow Your Own class. Very good. Um, and these will be saved. So if you miss a session, just get in touch with me and I can share that with you. Okay. But, um, Upcoming ones are how to extend the season for the garden, common vegetable garden pests, uh, success tips with fruit trees, soil building for better plant health, and um, successful composting in Nevada, which if you have any vegetable or fruit matter, coffee grounds, that can be compost. Wow, okay. Yep. Let's see. Um, something else, it's still Tuesday, so you have time to um, purchase a ticket for the Prump Valley Garden Club annual landscape tour. Um, tickets are $7. You get a map. Um, there were some at the extension office, but I'm going to guess by this Tuesday they're probably <laughs> sold out. But they also have them at Do It Best Hardware, Sunflower Fashions, and Prump Community Library. And we have some at the Master Gardener booth at Farmer's Market, but since it's Tuesday, you probably missed that window. <laughs> but if you need to get in touch with the Garden Club, um, the number is 775-537-7553, or I can put you in touch with them. Um, it's just fun. You get to go around and look at other people's gardens. Great. Um, and if you have any questions, our website is extension.unr.edu, and you can find the Master Gardener program on there. To register for the Master Gardener program, it's the HTTPS bit.ly HHC 2023. Okay, and all that information is there. 
Be sure to contact Heather if you have any questions at all. Thank you for watching. And Heather, thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much. Okay.